first of all, I would like to, to greet everyone. A warm welcome to all of you coming from all of the world. Um, my name is Thierry Dudoc de Witt, and um, I'll be the, the host for this series of uh, EC webinars on, on the space environment, hazards, and, and risks associated with the space environment. So last week, we talked about extreme events. And today, we have the pleasure to have with us Annika Seppel. It's five o'clock in the morning where she is now. <laughs> so she got up very early because she's in New Zealand. Um, Annika would be addressing today a vast topic, which is how solar activity interacts uh, with climate. Um, and it's actually quite a challenge to address this in, <laughs> in 45 minutes. So maybe just a few words. Um, uh, Annika did her research in, um, in, in, in Finland, at the University of Helsinki, and then she got a Marie Curie Fellowship. She went to the British, uh, British Antarctic Survey, BAS, and uh, also kept on working at the Finnish Meteorological Institute. And in five years ago, she moved to New Zealand, where she now is, has a faculty position at the University of um, Otago. So Annika is someone who has done, I think she has a very versatile profile because she's worked on experimental data, but on simulations as well, investigating mostly um, chemical dynamical coupling in the atmosphere, um, in particular involving um, the role of energetic particles. So she's well known in the community for all the studies she performed. And I think it's really great to have her with us today. And I think with that, we're ready to start. So the floor is yours, Annika. <laughs> Thank you, Thierry. I will share my screen. Maybe I'll just say to the attendees that if you have questions, don't hesitate to write them in the chat, um, and we'll go through the questions at the end of the talk. Right. So hopefully everyone can see my uh, presentation slide now. Do let yes. me know if you can't. <clears throat> So thank you, Theo, for this nice introduction, and thank you for asking me to give this talk. It's my favorite to topic to talk about, but like you said, it's um, it's very broad. So let's have sort of an overview look at the system that we're going to be addressing today. So this is this is really the big picture. We have Sun on the left, and we have Earth on the right. This tiny tiny dot in there. And what we can see around Earth is our magnetosphere, our protective bubble with these blue lines. And of course, then we can see there's a big eruption coming from the sun. So what exactly are these different sort of things in our space environment that are important for Earth's climate? Well, we've got solar radiation. That's the first one. That's uh, that's the main thing that gives us a nice, warm, habitable planet and it actually gives us 10 to 17 watts of energy. So 10 to 17 joules per second uh, is what we get from solar radiation at Earth. So this is a really important energy source for our climate. But that's not the whole thing, because as, as we can see in the picture, sun has got these big eruptions. There's the solar wind um, plasma, charged particles coming from the sun. And they've been estimated to provide at the edge of the magnetospheric boundary 10 to 18 watts. So we can see that these are similar sorts of scales, but actually the charged particle from solar wind, that component is potentially larger. The difficult thing with this is how much of this energy actually gets transferred into the climate, because this is the estimate at the boundary of the magnetosphere, so around here. Um, and that's not all. So we've got our magnetosphere, which is also filled with particles. And these charged particles also end up in the Earth's atmosphere, and they end up having an effect on our climate. Um, from the perspective of climate, and I'm really talking about the atmosphere here, it doesn't really matter where the charged particles come from. They have similar effects in the atmosphere. So we tend to bundle the solar particles and particles from Earth's magnetospheric origins under this term of energetic particles. So we're talking about electrons and protons that have quite high kinetic energies and they're able to penetrate into the atmosphere and they will cause effects in there. So I'm going to talk about all these effects but I'm really focusing on the energetic particle side because that's my particular area of interest. Now I want to talk about some of the key challenges at first and going back to these in the talk. 
So two of the big ones, um, really thinking of this energy particle side here, is that it's really difficult to measure the amount of these charged particles coming into the atmosphere. It's been a, a challenge for a long time. And the, there are a range of challenges. The particles have different energies and they also have um, varying fluxes. And to really understand the impact on the atmosphere properly, we do need to have accurate observations of both those energies and the fluxes. So we know the energy spectra and the flux of the particles coming in. This is really critical for understanding and properly including the impacts on atmospheric and climate models. And we've done quite a lot of work on that in the last 10 years, but there are still many things that we need to improve on. Um, the second thing, which is a massive challenge, is that the atmosphere is a really complex coupled system. We have chemistry, <clears throat> excuse me, we have dynamics. So understanding how the impact from the particles couple all the way to Earth's surface climate is quite difficult to unravel. So looking at all those physical and, and chemical coupling mechanisms, that kind of this whole chain of connections is still under investigation. We've been looking at that for a long time, but the atmosphere is, is a complex beast as I will show you. So this is kind of the premise of the talk today. So we're going to look through these different effects and then I'm going to talk about the key challenges as they come up and hopefully highlight, particularly the second bullet, why show you why this is really so complicated. So actually, let's start by looking at some basic things about the Earth's atmosphere. So you know what kind of system I'm talking about. So Earth has a neutral atmosphere as well as ionosphere. I'm not going to go into the ionosphere today. We're just going to worry about the neutral layer. So we've got these three um, layers in the Earth's atmosphere and the, the layers are just based on what the Earth's temperature profile looks like. So if we look right at the bottom, we have troposphere. Here, this is where all of our weather happens. This is where we live. And in the troposphere, <clears throat> the surface is heated by sunlight. And as we go up, temperature starts to decrease. So a temperature profile looks like that, so it goes down. Then we get to the stratosphere. This is where we have our ozone layer and ozone absorbs incoming solar UV radiation. So temperatures start increasing again as we go up. After that, we have mesosphere where temperatures cool down again. So you can see that this layered structure really is based on this kind of switching of the temperature profile. And these three layers are the ones I'm gonna focus on because they are the ones that are mainly impacted by solar radiation and energetic particles. So that's the basic structure. Now, the composition of the atmosphere is really important. We've got the main constituents, which are nitrogen and oxygen, which make up almost 100% of the total molecules in the atmosphere. Less than 1% are something we call minor gases or minor constituents. And these are gases like ozone, CO2, water vapor, NO, NO2, methane. Um, here we have a simulation of distribution of CO2 in the atmosphere, for example. So you can start seeing how complicated the system really is. Now, these gases, although there's very little of them in the atmosphere, they're really important because they absorb both incoming solar radiation as well as radiation coming from the Earth's surface. Earth's surface having a temperature means that it will radiate. It's a radiating black body. And some of that radiation is absorbed in the atmosphere as well. So although there's very little of these gases, they have a very critical role. And I'm particularly going to go back to ozone in my talk today. Right. Now, that's that's the chemistry side, but you could see all that swirling motion. Earth's atmosphere is moving. Um, it's moving at smaller scales when we're close to the surface. But as we go further up, we have some of these large scale motions going on in the atmosphere. So basically, solar radiation heats up the air at the equator and this air rises. Uh, also the, the summer pole is, is warm, so the air rises. And then overall, the air sinks at the winter pole. So what my picture here looks like is on the horizontal axis, we have a cut from the winter pole on the left through the equator to the summer pole on the right. And on the vertical axis, we have altitude from surface to about 90 kilometers. So this covers these three layers that I was talking about. 
So we've got this overall large scale rising motion at the equator and the summer pole, and then the air turns towards the winter pole, and that's where it starts sinking down. Now, because we have a very large temperature gradient between the winter pole and the equator, remember the equator is being heated, strong winds are formed um, between the equator and the winter pole. So this is a strong wind pattern that flows from the west to east. And because of this, we have a feature forming in the winter pole, and I'm going to show you an image of what it looks like at the moment, uh, this feature that we call the polar vortex. Now, this is important because basically these strong winds isolate all the air that's inside the polar vortex. And I'm going to come back to this when I talk about the particles. Now, tying the chemistry back into this, we have Earth's ozone layer that is here between about 20 and 40 kilometers. So it's the chemistry is on top of all this dynamical stuff. And those things are connected. So if we look at what the wind patterns actually look like, um, these are animations. This, this particular one is viewing in the Southern Hemisphere, where I am. It's also an important hemisphere. So this is from the Earth um, Null School. If you're interested, you can see all the latest ones by just going to the website. So if we are at the surface level, we can see these quite complex wind patterns. So this is the surface level wind. Now, if we move up, that changes. So if we go to about 10 kilometers altitude, we start seeing some of the really strong wind patterns. So we've got jet streams and we start seeing much stronger winds overall. If we go further up, and this one I grabbed for the Northern Hemisphere for you guys, and this is basically the wind pattern today. So we're at roughly at 30 kilometers altitude. Now we can see this polar vortex that I was talking about. So we have these really strong wind patterns forming roughly around the pole, but we can see that it's not symmetric. Now this is important when we go back to thinking about uh, the chemistry and the particle effects later on, because all the air inside here is really isolated. The strong winds means that the air can't mix horizontally, so it's all trapped inside these strong winds. And at the same time, we know that there's this overall pushing of air down over the winter pole. So all the air that's inside the polar vortex can only go downwards. So if we have any changes in the chemistry, which I will talk about later on, those will be isolated inside the polar vortex and all that air that has been affected will move down because that's the only way it can go. So that's our overall system that we're dealing with. We have chemistry going on, we have dynamics going on, these are connected and essentially they end up connecting all the different layers. So that's the uh, particularly dynamics. I don't go into details in this figure but there are different types of waves and they essentially help connect all the different layers in a quite rapid manner. Okay, so now that we've established kind of basic setup, let's start looking at the effects. So I'm gonna start with solar radiation and what we understand of the effects on climate. So when we talk about solar radiation, we tend to talk about two different things. And the most important thing possibly for our climate is the total solar radiance, also known as TSI. So this reflects the total radiative power that Earth receives from the sun. So we can do a very simple calculation, and I do this with my students. And we can find that on average, at Earth's average orbital distance, we get about 1,361 watts per square meter. And from this, we can then calculate that Earth gets in total about 10 to 17 watts of solar radiative power. Now, if we look at observations of TSI over many years, in this figure, there's, um, there's the current TSI composite. And to ask theory about this, if you have questions, I believe he's responsible for this. Uh, what we can see is that there is an 11 year cycle. So sun has an 11 year magnetic cycle, and we can see this in the total radiative power that we receive. So we can see these nice 11 year cycles but overall the amount of radiation only varies about 0.1 percent over this whole 11 year cycle so it's really small variation this is an important number it provides the basic power 
to our climate, but the variation is really small. Now we do know that soil activity and climate correlate over longer time scales like centuries, but we also know that the changes that we see in the solar power output are way too small to explain the recent rapid changes that we see on our global average temperatures. So it's really important number, but it's not the cause of climate change. Now, what exactly is the influence on climate then? Well, this has been looked at in detail. And in general, I'd like to point out that if we didn't have the solar radiated power, Earth would be an icy ball in space. So we need the total solar radiance, we need this radiated power from the sun, we also need our atmosphere, and together these give us a nice habitable climate. If we didn't have one or the other, this would be the end result, just an icy ball in space. So TSI, very important, we don't want an icy ball in space. Um, when we look at the overall energy balance in the climate system, what we use is the TSI. So this is um, from the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, looking at the, the overall energy balance in the climate system. And I've adapted it to the latest number. So this figure is actually from the assessment report number five, assessment report number six has come out. I've just updated the numbers for that. So for us, the important number here is this 340, which is the incoming solar power at the top of the atmosphere. So this number actually comes from the previous number that we saw, that 1,360. And then this is distributed in different ways in the atmosphere. So that's a key number for our climate system. We absolutely need this incoming power. Um, but then we have our atmosphere, and this is where the minor gases like ozone and CO2 have a huge impact because they affect how this energy is distributed in the system. They absorb some of the incoming solar radiation. They will <clears throat> albedo reflect some of this away. Some gets all the way to the surface directly, is absorbed, heats the surface, then the surface radiates upwards. Again, these minor gases absorb uh, some of the radiation coming from the surface and this is where gases like CO2 are really important they radiate it back upwards and downwards and this whole system ensures that we have habitable temperatures at the surface and the current issue that we're facing is that there's an imbalance in the system because of the composition of the atmosphere has changed but TSI overall is really important for our climate now if we look at kind of regional scale effect instead of just focusing on a global picture we know that if we look at differences between solar cycle maximum and minimum even though the difference in TSI is only about 0.1 percent there are really observable changes in things like sea surface temperatures and pre precipitation patterns that we have here in this figure but what you can see is these are really regional scale responses so for example in surface temperatures we know that during solar maximum, um, the North Pacific tends to be warmer and they're close to the equator in the, <clears throat> excuse me, Eastern um, Pacific region, um, the surface temperatures are cooler. So these are regional scale patterns. You can see the same in the, in the precipitation patterns here in the bottom figure. Now the physical mechanisms for these, are reasonably well understood because TSI is so important. A lot of effort has gone into understanding these. So that's TSI is probably the best understood effect on climate that we have at the moment. But TSI is not the whole story with radiation. We also have sort of spectral radiance or SSI. Now TSI is capturing the total power, but if we start looking at different wavelengths, we can really start seeing more variability in the TSI, particularly looking at the UV. A few years ago, it was discovered that the variability at the UV wavelengths is, is much larger than in the overall TSI variations. And UV radiation is really important for the atmosphere. Think of ozone that absorbs UV radiation, right? We have changes, changes in the ozone and the atmosphere. We have changes in, changes in the UV radiation coming from the sun together 
these will have important effects. And here I just got um, figures just indicating what uh, black body radiance for sun at some surface temperature would look like. It's this smooth line, but actually, if we look at the radiation coming from the sun, so the x axis here is wavelength and the y axis is the intensity of the radiation coming at those different wavelengths. So we've got UV or ultraviolet here, visible parts of the spectrum in the middle, and then infrared later on. And looking at the range of variability in the incoming solar radiation, this black line would be the actual radiation coming from the sun at a specific moment. And it's not the smooth line, it's very spiky, and it does vary quite a lot. So some of this variability is shown by these two figures here, looking at two different wavelength ranges. So for example, 120 to 200 nanometers. So we're in the UV part of the spectrum and looking at how the irradiance at those wavelength changes over the years. And we can see that there's quite a bit of variability, but we can still see this sort of 11 year structure in there. So what effects does that have in the atmosphere? Well, let's go back to the ozone. So ozone is important gas in the atmosphere. UV radiation is key for understanding ozone chemistry in the atmosphere. So basically, almost all of really extreme UV coming from the sun is absorbed by ozone in the atmosphere, both ozone in the stratosphere, in the main ozone layer, but also in the mesosphere. So that's the layer above the stratosphere. Now, if we look at a simple ozone photochemistry picture, which I have here on the left, um, so we have ozone molecule here, O3, and we've got other forms of oxygen. So O2 is the main oxygen molecule in the atmosphere, about 20% of the atmosphere is O2. And then we have two different atomic oxygens. And these cycles are known as Chapman cycles rely on a UV photon. So all these blue circles that I have indicate that a UV photon was present. And there's only one ozone producing reaction in the atmosphere, and that is from this atomic oxygen into the ozone molecule. So for that whole balance with ozone, UV radiation is really important. Now, this then links back to atmospheric dynamics because ozone, absorbing the incoming solar radiation. So this is my figure here on the right. This is an old textbook figure. It's indicating how much heating in the atmosphere happens just because ozone is absorbing the incoming UV radiation. So we have solar radiation coming here at the top of the atmosphere. And at the peak, so this black line here that goes to about 12 Kelvin per day is from the effect that ozone is absorbing the incoming UV. So the fact that we have got ozone in the atmosphere is actually a really important source of heating in the atmosphere. Now imagine if you have varying levels of radiation coming in or varying levels of ozone in the atmosphere, that amount of heating is going to change. If you change the amount of heating in the atmosphere, you will link directly into dynamics because temperature is an important factor in the overall dynamical variability in the atmosphere. So there we have a link from chemical balance to dynamical balance. If we change dynamics, if we change winds, we will change the distribution of ozone. So we get into this quite complicated coupling between chemistry and dynamics just via ozone here. So what do we know about the solar cycle level effects in ozone? Well, this has been looked at quite a lot. So we're looking at solar max versus solar minimum. And we have many years of observations of ozone. So this is from a composite study that was published just three years ago by William Ball. And here on the left, we have equatorial ozone responses. So this is difference in ozone in percentage between solar maximum and solar minimum. And this really goes back to the UV. Um, and these are all observations of all the different squiggles are different instruments or different way of combining those, those data sets. And they roughly all agree. And we can see in uh, 
the stress wave we look at between 30 and 40 kilometers, you can see sort of up to two to four percent differences between solar maximum and solar minimum. And it may sound like a little, but it's actually really important, even if it is a small change for the atmosphere that would have important consequences. Now, the middle panel is indicating how well different climate models are actually capturing this variability. So we're trying to do our best to make sure that models actually represent the real world variability. So what we have here is the variability in temperature shown by this pink shading, the uh, variability in the observations shown by the pink shading. And then the different other lines are different chemistry climate models. And overall, they are capturing this variability. So they're, they're seeing the same changes between solar max and solar min in roughly the same places, but they don't all agree. Climate models tend to not produce exactly the same result, but they're very close. And then if we look at um, bigger picture in the atmosphere, so this was just equatorial atmosphere here. If we start looking at different latitudes, so we go from the South Pole to the North Pole, roughly, and then looking throughout the stratosphere. So this is now pressure scale, and it's inverted because pressure decreases as we go up. And we can see that there is a, a response from solar max to solar min. And that's what we're looking throughout the year, and it's, it's spread throughout the atmosphere, but it's not constants and it's not the same everywhere so it does vary quite a lot so ozone is really affected by the uv so so what happens from then we have a reasonable understanding of the mechanisms now so we have incoming solar uv that impacts ozone production now that will have a link to radiative heating like we saw in that old textbook figure so that will change temperatures <clears throat> most of the radiation is coming in at the equator so the biggest changes are at the equator. If you change equatorial temperatures, but don't change polar temperatures that much, you will change the gradient between those two regions. If you change the temperature gradient, that will have an almost immediate effect on, on winds. So this equatorial change will impact winds closer to the pole. If you change the winds, then you change wave propagation conditions in the atmosphere, and that will allow that effect to couple towards the surface. So I'm not going to go into detail in that, but we have a, a reasonably good understanding of these mechanisms. So I've got sort of a summary of that, but if you're interested, do look at the paper that I've linked. So we've got um, a range of review papers on these uh, mechanisms that have been published in the last 10 years or so. So that's what I want to cover with the radiation. And then I want to talk about energetic particles and how they influence climate. So energetic particles are an interesting beast. So sun is losing mass. It's losing mass via radiation. And that's about four times 10 to nine kilograms per second um, because it's converting mass into energy. But sun is also losing matter. So we've got solar wind where we have big solar eruptions, and that amounts to about 10 to 9 kilograms per second. If we have big explosions like this one, so this was a big solar storm back in 2003, they can send out 10 to 12 kilograms of plasma. Now, I've given public talks on this and trying to explain how much 10 to 12 kilograms is, is um, it's, it's quite a challenge. So I've come up with this analogy. Um, I don't know about Europe, but in New Zealand, and from my understanding, in North America, trucks are quite popular cars. So this is a massive vehicle that weighs about two tons. One solar explosion equals about 500 million trucks. I'm trying to imagine 500 million of these massive vehicles. And one of these explosions that happens in a matter of minutes or hours will send out 500 million of these. Just solar wind in general will send about half a million of these trucks. So maybe that gives a bit of a scale to the large numbers. Of course, scientists will accept 10 to 12, but how much is it really? It's it's a lot. It's it's many trucks. Don't want to be bulldozed over by those trucks. Um, what we can see in this video as well is how much variability there is. So 
the level of particles coming out from the sun, so these electrons and protons that are being chucked out, varies a lot. Not just with the 11 year solar cycle, but from year to year, from day to day, there's a large variability. So we tend to just um, bundle the, the solar particles and the magnetic particles, as I mentioned earlier, into this term energetic particles. So the, like I said earlier, this is because the atmosphere doesn't really mind what the origin was. It just um, cares about what the impact on the atmosphere is. So we can have solar proton events that are these massive ex explosions from the sun. And the protons that come from those really impact the entire polar region of the atmosphere. And we're talking about the North and the South Pole. But these tend to be really sporadic. They happen every once in a while. But if we start looking at the more gentle solar wind effects as well as our magnetospheric effects, then we start looking at energetic electron precipitation. And this tends to happen near the auroral oval. And from the climate perspective, this is really important and interesting because these energy electrons are almost always there at some level. It's varying level, but it's almost always there. And we also have very different levels of energies of these electrons. So this is something that our community has looked more and more into, particularly in the last 10 or so years, and we start to understand it a bit better. But there are huge challenges with these, like I said, at the start. Measuring the particles is challenging. Understanding the amount of them coming to the atmosphere is, is really um, quite difficult, uh, but we're doing our best. So overall, thinking of climate, going back to that idea, we have these big solar storms, but we have also this um, electron precipitation. And the key for us is that it's almost always present at some level. We just don't necessarily know um, exactly in fine detail at what level. So if we start going to the atmosphere, what's happening with these particles? Like I said, we don't really mind whether they came from the sun or from the magnetosphere. Because they're charged particles, they are guided by the Earth's magnetic field. So here we have a simple sketch of the Earth's magnetic field, and we have the two polar regions, and we have electrons and protons that are heading downwards towards the atmosphere. So when they're far away, they're just simply guided by uh, the magnetic field lines, and they're going down, down towards the pole and really concentrated in those polar regions. But as we're getting closer to the surface, the particles are not only guided by the magne magnetic field lines now, but they actually meet the atmosphere and they start colliding with uh, different atoms and molecules in the atmosphere. And one of the consequences that we get from this is the beautiful aurora. Um, that is from the particles meeting the atmosphere, but the particles will continue further on from the aurora. And what happens then, and this is, um, come up with this term of Pac-Man chemicals. So what the particles end up doing, and, and I will show you the details, but they essentially influence the chemistry of the atmosphere and create molecules called NOx and HOx. And the reason why we call these the Patman chemicals is because they take part in catalytic ozone loss. Catalytic means that the, the molecule will react with ozone, destroy the ozone, convert into another form within the same molecule family, react with ozone again, and convert back to the original molecule. So in these reaction cycles, the particles that were originally produced by this, these energetic particles coming in are not destroyed and they will continue reacting with ozone. So we've got our energetic particles producing these Pac-Man chemicals. Now this is in the polar region. Remember we've got the polar vortex there. The only way they can go is down. So they're isolated inside the polar vortex and they descend down with the overall air movement in the atmosphere and go deeper down in the atmosphere. And then we are in the part of the atmosphere where we have a lot of ozone. And what our Pac-Man chemicals do is they start chomping away on the ozone. And what we've seen from satellite observations is that particularly as a consequence of really large solar storms, there can be large scale ozone loss happening in the atmosphere. So these are 
the results uh, published quite a few years now, but I want to show these because they are from that exact solar storm that I showed you earlier, that big explosion back in 2003. And it was the first time that we were actually measuring ozone in the atmosphere at the same time as we were measuring one of these Pac-Man chemicals. And this one is called NOXO or nitrogen. And in the top two figures, on the left, we have the ozone field focusing on the northern hemisphere. This happened in October, November. So northern hemisphere is in the winter. We have our polar vortex. That's a very typical ozone field. This is in the upper stratosphere at about 45 kilometers altitude. Um, on the top right, we have the NOx field, very typical at winter time. There isn't really a source for these NOx gases during winter up in the stratosphere, other than the particles. So there's very little in the polar region. You can see all that blue. Now, after the storm, if we look at the same situation, now we can see that a lot of the ozone is gone. So there was about 60% ozone loss happening at these altitudes right after these storms. And then if we look at the NOx field, there's a huge increase. So these Pac-Man chemicals increased because they were produced by the particles and they were able to chomp away on the ozone. And these effects lasted for about a couple of months. So it was quite a long effect on the atmosphere. Now, promised some more details. So this is actually more detailed chemical response for the particles coming in. So if we have our electrons and protons, from solar explosions, from solar wind, or from the magnetosphere coming in, the shared effect that they all have is that they ionize the main components of the atmosphere, so N2 and O2, which produces ions in the atmosphere, as my top square box. And then what happens is that we have these two different pathways that lead to production of Hox gases and NOx gases, and these are our two Pac-Man chemicals. So I'm not going to go through the chemistry in detail, but there are some examples of the Hox production on the left-hand side, for example. There are many different pathway, pathways with this. Now, NOx, uh, sorry, Hox on the left, really important. Uh, it causes rapid but quite short-lived ozone loss, particularly in the mesosphere between 50 and 80 kilometers. But Hox itself has a short chemical lifetime. So Lots of hox is produced as we have the particles coming in. And when the particle levels go back down, the not the hox will, will go away quite quickly. So it doesn't have another as effective source. It doesn't have a long chemical lifetime in the atmosphere. So it has a direct impact on the ozone levels right where it's produced by the particles. And these are very dramatic effects. Now, if we look at the uh, right hand side, we have NOx. So this is um, N plus NO plus NO2. So it's a family of gases. Um, the way they're produced in, in the chemical reactions is shown there. But what I want to emphasize is that NOx in general is really important for stratospheric ozone balance, not just the NOx produced from these particles, but NOx in the atmosphere in general is known to be important for ozone balance. And why the NOx that's been produced by particles is so interesting is because NOx is only destroyed by sunlight. So if we are in the polar night, it's dark, we have a big solar storm, for example, lots of the particles are coming in, they produce the NOx, we're inside the polar vortex, the NOx will start descending because the air masses overall are descending. It will stay there for a very long time. It will descend further down in the stratosphere where we have a lot of ozone and it can have a large impact on the stratospheric ozone balance. And this is something we call an indirect effect. So the Hox gases have a direct big impact where they are produced in the atmosphere. We can see it in the ozone levels. NOx, on the other hand, goes back into this chemical dynamical coupling in the atmosphere. Um, it's been produced somewhere, but then it gets transported and it can react somewhere else other than where it was produced. So we can have effects on ozone in the atmosphere in parts where the particles coming in, the energy particles coming in, didn't directly impact the atmosphere. Now, 
the blue uh, box at the bottom is just an example of one of these catalytic that goes on lost cycles that I was talking about. So the excess in there can be any gas from the Hox or Nox family. And overall, they will react to destroy in this particular reaction cycle an ozone molecule, but also atomic oxygen. And this is important because to produce ozone, if you remember in one of those earlier slides, we needed um, the atomic oxygen. So if we're taking that away in these catalytic loss cycles, that means that we won't be able to produce another ozone molecule. So that's as effective as destroying two ozone molecules. And that's just an example of one of the chemical reactions. Now we've got more observations of effects of solar storms as well as um, energy electron potential coming from the magnetosphere. So here's another view of that same solar storm um, showing you more of the polar view. So we have NOx in the top panels on the left-hand side and ozone in the bottom panels. But this only also shows the polar vortex edge with the red line as well as a plus sign for where the geomagnetic pole is. So really showing that uh, we have the particles coming in and they're guided by the magnetic field. And then if you look in the panel that's labeled 29th of October, we can see that lots of NOx was produced close to where the magnetic pole is because that's where the particles are guided into that polar magnetic area. And then the NOx starts to be contained within the polar vortex. And we can see that lots of the effects on ozone are also focused inside the polar vortex. Now, on the right-hand side, we looked at different satellite instruments and, and looked for effects of electrons. So big solar storms are quite easy to observe. We know it's coming. We know it's an immediate big effect. But the electrons coming in um, into the atmosphere, they're almost always there at some level. So the effects are not as easy to spot. But we've uh, looked at this from various different instruments. And, and one of the studies is shown here, where, for example, if we look at, so on the right-hand side, the panel label D, we have um, vertical altitude from about 60 kilometers up to 80 kilometers. This is um, ozone observations in the Northern Hemisphere. And then the x-axis indicates um, how many days we are from a burst of particles coming in. So this day zero means that that's when a number of particles start coming in. So we did this study um, using method called superposed epoching. Now, what we found with this is that if we look at between 70 and uh, roughly 75 kilometers, we can see up to 20, 30% ozone loss. And we're looking at number of events and we can see quite a big ozone loss and um, we looked at different instruments and, and saw that we can really see these effects and they are important but these are observed effects so the next challenge was how to then include these in model simulations i'm just going to show you um now slightly different views of these those were kind of immediate effects we talked about these direct effects but now if we add in that polar vortex and the fact that the air is descending um there's lots of particle precipitation happening all the time at some level but like i said we have difficulties knowing exactly what those levels are but we know it's happening we know aurora is happening um very frequently if we look at the nox gases in the polar atmosphere so this is a study that was published using uh, data from the MIBUS instrument on NSAT satellite. So this covers years from 2002 to 2012, when contact with the satellite was lost. And this um, the study, they, they were able to isolate just the NOx that was produced by particles. And it says NOY in the figure, that's an extended NOx family. So it's, it's easy if we just think of NOx as is essentially um, the same important effect on the atmosphere. But what we can see here is, so our vertical axis is from 20 kilometers to 70 kilometers. So we're now covering both stratosphere and the mesosphere. The particles are coming in, they're having an effect quite high up initially in the mesosphere. But once the NOx has been produced, it 
can only be destroyed by sunlight. If we're in the polar winter, and this is the southern hemisphere, so trust me, this is the winter time, where um, in the northern hemisphere, the summer months, the air can only go down. So what we can see here is this descending feature that extends down in the atmosphere, down to almost 20 kilometers. And what was really exciting about this study is that we can see this happening pretty much every year. The levels are slightly different, but the same descending feature that gets very far down in the atmosphere is happening every winter. And these, these chemicals are largely produced by the particles coming from the magnetosphere or from the solar wind. And, and some of the big effects are from solar storms, but mostly it's the insect electrons. Um, now, if we look at the combined effect of the particles coming in and this downward transport in the polar vortex, what these authors found is that this NOx makes up up to 30% of the total polar NOx at the end of the polar winter. So it's adding 30% into what's already naturally there. And that is a lot. Now, this study was able to trace this NOx until about um, end of August, early September. So that's around the time when and spring is arriving in the Southern Hemisphere. So what we did um, was trying to extend that using a different instrument. So we looked at something known as a total column or stratospheric column of NOx and then looked at how those polar stratospheric NOx columns, so this is just summing over all the NOx that's in the atmosphere between about um, 15, 20 kilometers and 50 kilometers. So we only get one number instead of a nice profile. But we looked at how these levels vary depending on the insect particle precipitation levels. Um, we used the geomagnetic activity proxy for this. And what we found is that basically, if we have more energy particle precipitation coming in, still in November in the Southern Hemisphere, we can see more NOx. So it doesn't just end where we finish seeing those descending features. That NOx that was, remember, up to 30% of the total NOx, we can still see that in November. Interestingly, we also saw an effect in November polar ozone. Now, we were expecting that NOx is a catalytic destroyer of ozone, therefore it should reduce the ozone levels. What we found is that when there's more particle activity, we actually had more polar ozone. And this is ozone in the ozone layer. So this was quite unexpected result. The different colors in these figures indicate different dynamical conditions in the atmosphere. Like I've said, there's a complex coupling between the chemistry and dynamics. I don't want to go in that in detail, but if you want to know more, I've got the papers listed there in the corner and it's all open access. So you can have a look at that. But this was really unexpected. Um, and we went on and tried to find out a bit more. So basically the time we're looking at in these um, September, October, November, is the time when Southern Hemisphere Antarctica has massive ozone hole. It's the peak ozone hole season. There's an animation of the 2021 ozone hole season. Now, my pink pacments here are chlorine from CFCs. This is the main cause for the Antarctic ozone hole. And um, what we're expecting is if we add in the NOx, that the only thing that should do is reduce the ozone further. But actually what we found is that um, the NOx Pac-Man reacts with the chlorine Pac-Mans and stop both of those gases from reacting with ozone. And that's why we saw these increases in ozone levels when we had more particle precipitation coming in. Uh, that's quite exciting. So more ozone when there's more particle activity because it's able to take away some of the horrible um, CFC effects on the ozone layer. Now, we have ozone effects, but what about the link to climate? Now, if we change ozone higher up in the 
atmosphere because of all these dynamical coupling mechanisms that could affect um, climate conditions further down. So what we've done is we looked at meteorological data and looking at surface temperature variability between times of high particle activity years and low particle activity years, focusing really on the winter season. So these two figures that I have here are the differences um, on the left-hand side for the Northern Hemisphere winter season, so December, January, February, um, and the Southern Hemisphere winter season on the right, so June, July, August. So there's different in surface temperatures between high particle activity levels and low particle activity levels. And we saw these regional scale changes that are up to sort of plus minus five degrees. But what you can see is, is the effects are really regional. So if we average over the whole picture to look at global um, effect, there won't be any because it's just a regional scale effect. Now, currently, if we include particle effects in atmosphere and climate models, they do not produce this level of temperature variability. <clears throat> we have two candidates why we think why. One is that we think we're not correctly capturing the energy particle effect in the model because it's so difficult to know the exact levels that those particles are coming in. The other option is that the model is not capturing some sort of physical process in the atmosphere. But I think the prime candidate is with the particle forcing, so EPP, NJ particle representation. Now, the exciting thing in this whole thing is, though, that these particle effects are included in the IPCC climate simulations for the models that can do that. Um, and that's something new. So in the latest assessment report, particles were included in some of the models because this is, is recognized as an important source of variability for climate now and for the atmosphere. All right, now how exactly does that affect climate? Um, it's really difficult to understand this because of all these chemical dynamical coupling mechanisms. So we published this paper last month where we're trying to explore these connections. And that's what this, this figure here shows. So we have this initial chain that we really focused on the day. So we have EPP, we have these particles coming in. They produce NOx or, or NOY gases in the atmosphere. So I have this red arrow from EPP to not NOY. So more EPP, more NOx. We know that in most of the atmosphere that will result in, in reduction in ozone. Now, this is where it gets complicated because you can have different sorts of heating effects from ozone depending on whether you're in the night or in sunlit atmosphere. And that's what these QRS and QRL boxes indicate. So short wave heating or long wave cooling and ozone impacts both. And then it gets really messy because now you also have dynamics in the atmosphere that can have varying effects and all these together impact temperatures so this is this gray box with t so many different arrows leading into that box and out of that box that um, understanding this um, actual physical mechanism from the ozone changes into the temperatures is it's very complicated because you have to basically look at this whole picture uh, what we were able to do is kind of try and isolate everything as much as possible and in our model simulations we can see that the ozone changes caused by particles is actually leading to cooling of the stratosphere but that meant having to isolate for all these other effects and arrows in this picture so we're taking one one step further in understanding this but we're not yet there in understanding how these effects in the stratosphere then propagate all the way to the surface um, and then on top of this, uh, I was showing these uh, results relating to the ozone hole. Well, the ozone hole is, re is recovering, but very slowly. So it's expected to recover, I want to say, by 2070 at the moment. So the CFC gases are slowly going away and ozone should start healing. Now, there was a recent study by Ville Moliniemi that showed that actually what's going to happen in the future is because the overall dynamics in the atmosphere are changing, more NOx that's produced by particles will actually be transported in the stratosphere. And that means if we take away the chlorine, the NOx is not going to be reacting with that anymore. The NOx will start reacting with ozone in the stratosphere in the future. So we're going to have more particle-produced NOx in the stratosphere where we have the main ozone layer. 
the NOx is likely going to be uh, very important for future ozone variability in the polar regions. I just want to finish with this figure. Um, as so we talked about the importance of our space environment to climate, if we look at how climate modeling has grown over the decades, since the 2010s, um, atmospheric chemistry and the upper atmosphere, which here means stratosphere and mesosphere, were added into these complex climate models. And what I've shown you today is that those are parts of the atmosphere that are really sensitive to our space environment, the particles coming in, as well as radiation. So including these effects in climate simulations is really important, but we've got so many challenges left in that. Um, last year was the first time that particles were actually included in the intergovernmental panel for climate change simulations. We we know we need to improve those. We know that we did a gross underestimation with the particles with this, this first round because we wanted to be careful and conservative, but we know that there's still a lot of work to do. And we need we need better understanding of the particles. We also need better understanding of all the different coupling mechanisms. Yeah, so that's where I wanted to finish. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Annika, for this well. Really excellent, fascinating talk. I know you make you make excellent presentations and great pictures. <laughs> I was not disappointed. <laughs> so um, now is time to to take some questions. There are quite a few questions already in in the chat. Uh, maybe I'll take them in in the chronological order. Some have been partly answered already uh, during the presentation. So first of all. A uh, very early one by Boris is, is the horizontal velocity profile in the polar vortex similar to the Rankine vortex? I'm afraid I don't know what Rankine vortex is. So Boris, could you, um, if I might, let me just try to unmute you. If you could specify your question. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. A ranking vortex is a structure of the velocity, say, inside the hurricane. It has a constant angular velocity inside and decaying and azimuthal velocity on the periphery out of the <clears throat> center of the vortex. I saw that your velocities inside the vortex are pretty low. So there may be, if they have linear profile, then they will, it's a, it's a ranking structure. You will have linear profile inside and decaying velocity with radius in the outside. Is it something similar you observe in the, in the polar vortex? Um, from my understanding, what we know of the structure inside, it's much more variable. So it doesn't have to be nice and symmetric like you would have inside the vortex. There's more complex structure inside the vortex. And I think it just comes down to the sheer size of it. So you mm -hmm. can have a more intricate structure within the vortex. Well, generally, the, it would be sim similarity between the hurricane structure and the polar vortex. Is it does can is it observed? Is it correct to say that they're dynamically similar or not? This is the whole question. Um, I think it's different because there's there's just more more structure differences inside the polar vortex. You can have smaller scale things happening inside the polar vortex rather than in a in a hurricane which is smaller all right well in the hurricane it's it's a general you know in its average picture it's not instantaneously you will not see it you need to over average it over a long time yeah. I, i'm not sure that this data exists so i just ask you if so something jumps at you if it doesn't then it's fine i will i will look at it I, i'm I became interested in this from your talk as well. Thank you very much. It was very okay. interesting. Thank you. Thank you. So, let, so let's move on to Emeline Bourmont. She, she asked the question This has been partly answered later on. That was, that was an early question. Is Did the hole in the ozone layer influence the global ozone concentration profiles? And is it possible to disentangle this effect from solar-driven ones? Uh the answer to is it possible to disentangle this effect from solar driven ones? Mm -hmm. The answer to that is yes. Um, we can disentangle those ones, both from observations and model simulation point of view. We mm -hmm. can we can separate those effects. And that's also led us to look at this 
this interesting interplay between those effects. Mm-hmm. Uh, did the hole in the ozone layer influence global ozone concentration profiles? Not many people look at global ozone concentration profiles. But ozone being so important for regional scale changes, we tend to look at really the the distribution, the horizontal distribution of ozone. That's really important. Yeah, I see. But if if someone were to look at the global ozone average, then the polar region would absolutely have an effect on that. Mm. The ozone okay. hole. Okay, so Ilya Zoskin from Finland. <laughs> He asked, he could have asked in Finnish. Uh, thanks, so, so he, thanks for the nice talk. In the beginning, you showed the dynamical airflow, the, the pattern when air lifts at one pole and descends at the other via the upper stratosphere. And the air density at 90 kilometers is many orders of magnitude smaller than near ground. And how is the flux conserved? Oh, you're asking a detailed <laughs> physics question. Yes. <laughs> we, can, we can look at the equations separately. I'm I'm happy to do that. Um, But what I should um, note of that transport is that it's very slow. So it happens at very slow pace. This is not as fast as transport is slower down because exactly this point that Ilya's made that um, the air is very thin up there. Mm. So it also has time to expand. Um, There was a Question by Steven Spengler. So last week we had a talk by Ilya Zoskin about extreme solar events. And so he says there was this interesting talk on mega solar events of which there have been at least five in the past 10,000 years. Have there been any discussions of the effects of these events on atmospheric chemistry? And he knows papers suggesting that the end order of recent mass extinction might have been due to chemistry perturbations by a galactic gamma ray burst event. So Ilya might actually know better about um, any atmospheric studies, mm-hmm. specifically on galactic cosmic rays and galactic gamma ray bursts. I know there have been studies relating to large solar s- storms mm-hmm. that ha- we have in the past, like the Carrington effect, uh, Carrington event, mm-hmm. and the potential atmospheric effects of those because people are anxious that these are yeah. huge big events. Um, I don't know if anyone's looked at the particle effects of um, events from much further back i mean the the challenge that we're going to have is um we have difficulties understanding particle fluxes in present day when we have observations and going back in history we're only going to get some sort of rough estimate mm. and then trying to distinguish the the atmospheric effect from those is going to lead into lots of uncertainties okay in the in mm. the results I guess it's very challenging because it's so nonlinear that if you increase the flux by four orders of magnitude, it's just beyond reach. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so any cousin I've had two questions for you. <laughs> so the first, what are the impacts of EPP on the low troposphere dynamics in addition to temperature, which means uh, climate variability at the ground? That's question number one. <laughs> Okay, uh, question number one. I didn't include that in the talk because I thought it was complicated. Um, the studies we've published so far is that if we look at the dynamics, we can see that the tropospheric jets are shifting, and we think that's happening because of the response of uh, the particle effects. So essentially, ozone effects that are happening inside the polar vortex. So there's an effect on the polar vortex that's then causing a response in the tropospheric jets. And that's one of the key things that we think is leading to the surface level temperature responses. So I published that, uh, I want to say back in 2009. Um, No, 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 2013. So it was quite some years ago. And we're still trying to understand the fine details on those. But we know there's an effect on the tropospheric jets. Okay. So a second question, I'll include that one, uh, a question I had as well. So you discussed in the three types of direct solar events on, on climate. Is it possible to also have effects on climate from EPP? So here, my question would be globally, if you if you integrate in time, uh, is it how does it compare to a UV forcing? And uh, um, Annie's question is, um, sorry, um, what are the effects due to the modulation of the metos- magnetosphere by the internal magnetic field? So this is relevant to very long-term changes, which Ingrid Knossen also works on. <laughs> yeah, um, so the, the second question would definitely be for Ingrid. She's looked at this. 
and I'm not the right person to answer that question. Um, in the first part, so if we look at global effects and compare to solar UV, um, on global scales, I think that's quite difficult to assess. If I had to guess on global scales, UV might have a bigger effect. I don't actually know because we were so focused on looking at regional scale effects. Yeah. That's where I think both both the particles and UV are so important because they have these regional scale effects. Okay. Now, regional scale for for us our indiv as individuals, the regional scale effects are the ones that are important. Mm -hmm. I mean, the global number doesn't mean a lot to us, but each one of us will currently have very different climate conditions depending on which continent yeah. or maybe even yeah. which country we are in, and that's where. I think the most of the particle and the UV effects will mm. have the biggest impact on, on the variability at those scales. Okay, so I see that actually Ingrid is online. Uh, Ingrid, would you like to to comment <laughs> on the, these very long term changes? Is it is there any way we can see something? Oh, she says she hasn't hasn't got a microphone. Ah, okay, oh, that's too bad. But she will write yeah. something. I've that's got cool. the chat open. Okay, I'll read her answer later on then. Um, <laughs> so there were quite a few people thanking you again for the picture and so um so by ray bradley recent evidence of large solar proton events in like for example in 1774 ad suggests an order of magnitude increase relative to recent solar cycle variations so can you say something about the potential changes in surface climate so this is very connected to steve spengler's earlier question uh, okay, so uh, and, his, at, and then the it. second part is are the effects linear? And I guess not. Well, I let you answer. Uh, no, the effects are, are non-linear. That's the one of the biggest challenges that we have. Um, large SBEs. Um, that's that's interesting. So the one we mostly looked at is the Carrington event, and with that, the research focus has been on trying to understand the effects just of an atmospheric ozone. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think anyone's really looked at any potential regional scale climate implications of these big events. That would be an interesting study to do. But again, mm -hmm. like the challenge that we have is that to really understand the atmospheric and climate effects, we need to have reasonably good understanding of the, mm -hmm. the energy levels as well as the flux changes relating mm -hmm. to those particles. And that's the I think that's the most difficult thing to determine mm -hmm. for these historical events. Mm -hmm. But that would be interesting because we know we've had big solar storms in the past. We just haven't had one while we've had observations, which I guess is lucky because we okay. would be uh, <laughs> we would be suffering <laughs> with our technology. So in the meantime, Ingrid managed to write something. So her the answer to her previous question is. It is possible that magnetic field changes on multi-decadal timescales could influence particle precipitation. And certainly we know that due to the movements of the magnetic poles, the geographic locations where APP is most important will gradually shift. But I don't know how this will how this compares to EUV effects. Thank you very much, Ingrid, <laughs> for clarifying this point. Um, Mira Mandea had a question, which is the atmospheric dynamical response to mesospheric and stratospheric ozone variability? Oh, now that's a, that's a complicated question. Huh. Um, if we look at mesospheric ozone variability, I don't think we know in detail what the dynamical response for that would be. I think we understand better the dynamical responses for stratospheric ozone loss because we've had ozone hole and a lot of under, lots of work has gone into understanding what the dynamical consequences of the ozone hole is. So one thing that we know from from the ozone hole work is that whether the ozone hole is larger or smaller, uh, the level of ozone loss in the ozone hole that will affect where the tropospheric jets are. So mm -hmm. where where basically storm tracks will lie, whether they're further north or further south. So bigger ozone hole will push the storm tracks towards the equator. A smaller ozone hole will bring them closer to the polar regions. Mm -hmm. So stress rate ozone loss has uh, very tangible effects on dynamics. Mesospheric ozone loss is more complex, and I'm not sure I have an answer for that one. 
Mm, okay. And if I move on um, by John Cooper, might cosmic rays at the Pfotzer maximum, so 20 kilometers, be significant for low altitude forcing? Um, yes, I didn't talk about cosmic yes, rays in here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, just, I didn't have time. Um, so cosmic rays <laughs> are another time. thing. And, <laughs> and we know they're important. They're also included in climate models. But just, I just didn't cover that effect, um, the effects in my talk. But if okay. you look at any of the review papers and solar activity, they absolutely talk about cosmic rays as well. Mm. So any any was just specifying that her question was really related to global effects, uh, not uh, sorry, not uh, to regional effects, not the global ones. Her previous question. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And uh, one question by Bingham Liu, and he's asking how much more hox and nox would be generated by EPP compared to the case without comparing it without um, having uh, EPPs. Um. Okay, so how much production we get from EPP mm -hmm. over the background? The background, yes. Um, so we can have thousand percent level increases from solar storms of both of those gases. We've okay. got observational records of these, so we know the increases are hundreds to thousands of percent. Mm. So it's highly significant. Yes. Yeah. Um, Thomas Edman has a question. So, so whether in the lower atmosphere also impacts the ionosphere. And since AP is the primary parameter here, how could this impact your analysis? Uh, I'm not 100% sure. Do you want him to answer the question directly maybe? Or that let's do so. So Thomas, could you... Turn on your mic and. Yeah, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Hi, Thomas. <laughs> hello, Annika. Thanks for a nice talk. The question is um, does, Is there any influence on AP from, so from the weather below? So, as you have an impact into the ionosphere. Ah, okay. So, the, the AP is a signal itself, maybe impacted by the weather below and then perhaps the uh, analyzing the impact of of the weather on the weather or the planetary wave some planetary wave at the end and look uh, at the station for example okay i understand the question so most of the studies that we do we average ap over several months so i think if we think of weather because of the short time scale variability when we're averaging over several months we should average over any any short time scale effects potentially from the ground and we should be observing more of the the magnetic strike response to external forcings but you have seasonal effects of course also in the weather so planetary wave activity is seasonal dependent mm. um Maybe, but we do see, looking at geomagnetic activity indices, we do see indications of the 11 year solar cycle. So there's definitely something in there. And it is consistent if we look at the levels of particles coming in from the time that we have observations for, that the geomagnetic activity indices are capturing that fairly well on the sort of um, monthly to seasonal timescales. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. But there may be. But it's not the the AP index is not perfect. I mean, we obviously would like to use particle direct particle observations, as you know. Um, but that so far hasn't been possible. Okay, thanks. Okay. And since time is running fast now, I th I'll take one last question by uh, Daniel Carpenter. And so. We are, we are currently in a, in a phase of rising solar cycle. Do we expect that the impact of ozone hole recovery as we approach solar maximum? Or do we expect that the impact will be? So how well can we anticipate these changes in uh, NOx production with this cycle? Right, so increasing soil activity will lead to uh, more NOx in the atmosphere. I'm fairly confident of that. With ozone hole recovery, that's an interesting 
question. So from Southern Hemisphere perspective, I'm not sure if you Northern Hemisphere people will know, but the last three years we've had a record ozone hole. The mm -hmm. ozone layer is recovering, but we've also had a record ozone hole. Um, so we are certainly looking at the potential combined effects from what's currently happening with the ozone hole and what's happening with uh, EPP NOx with great interest here in the Southern Hemisphere. Okay. So I think um, then sometime we should stop, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, Anika, again, many thanks to you. Um, I, I wish to specify to all the attendees that it's very, we, Anika is 12 hours earlier <laughs> than us or away from us in New Zealand. So many thanks for getting up so early for giving this talk, for giving this excellent talk. Many thanks to you. I think we, I hope, I wish we could give an applause. So, <laughs> and um, next week, for those who are interested, we'll continue this series with a talk that will address a completely different topic by addressing the, the risks we pose on this space environment and not the inverse way. So thank you, everyone, and hopefully see you next week or soon again on an AC webinar. And thank you again very much, Anika. Have a good thank day. Thank you. It was my pleasure.